Are you feeling loving today? Uh, anybody lost that loving feeling? Um, I hope not because we're, <laughs> that's bad, wasn't it? I, whatever I can do for your entertainment this morning. Uh, I hope you haven't lost that love and feeling because we in fact are gonna be finishing up our series on uh, love intentionally today. It's like the 27th week. Now, if you're counting, it's I think the ninth week. And we've been working through it, taking as long as we need to, to cover 15 uh, characteristics of agape love in scripture. I hope you're feeling loving, but even if you're not feeling loving, I hope you're being loving because love is not a feeling, is it? Love is a choice. Love is not dependent on circumstances. It's not dependent on other people. It's not dependent on whatever happens to be going on in your mind or your heart at the moment. It depends on you making a choice and saying, I will love because Jesus loves me. God showed his love to us through Jesus. We show our love to each other because of Jesus. And we're gonna land the plane uh, today by covering five characteristics, the last five characteristics of agape love found in 1 Corinthians 13. Today, we're dealing with uh, verse seven and verse eight A, the very first part. If you have been following along with our daily devotions, and I hope you have, um, last week, uh, we had some fun working through each day, uh, uh, building the theme that was so important to us to move into this theme, which is going to be sort of the icing on the cake for the entire series, Love Never Fails. But there are four different steps we have to take before we get to Love Never Fails. We're going to read this together. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't participated in the daily uh, devotions at 7 a.m., if you have the church app downloaded, and your notifications turned on, Pastor Jared pushes to your phone or your device um, a link that has written a PDF file of the daily devotion. It also has a link to the audio that I've recorded for you. This week, I tried to be your morning DJ. So you can laugh at me, not even with me, but the content I hope will still be helpful for you because it's prayed over and stuff that I've really worked hard to try to give to you so that we can grow together. Um, Monday, we're going to be covering our first topic today, which is love always protects. Now, before we get there, let's read 1 Corinthians 13 together. Are you ready? This might be the last time we do it for a little while. Love is patient. You don't have to read it out loud. Just follow along with me in your minds. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. When I read this, it's like a walk down memory lane. To me, I remember the times we've had together each of the weeks as we've built this series together week by week and uh, experienced this with you. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes and always perseveres. And here we are, love never fails. My wife and I, when we moved to Arkansas, uh, we decided that we wanted to be farmers. We'd never been farmers. Well, Joy grew up on a, on a cattle farm, cattle ranch in Arkansas. So she knew the ranch world, didn't know the farm world. Uh, and so we made a couple of decisions to get into um, to raising animals. One was pigs, which was a terrible decision. Some of you know, uh, I've said that I agree with the Old Testament. They're filthy animals. I almost didn't eat bacon again. That didn't last very long. Just not bacon that I raised. But chickens were a different subject. Joy and I loved raising chickens. Joy particularly loved her chickens. When you raise chickens, you have to protect them because chickens are pretty defenseless. Now, roosters can fight. Um, and uh, we've talked about that before. Uh, I was trained in how to kick a rooster, which I thought I would never do until a rooster attacks you with its spurs. And you're like, all right, kicking it doesn't seem so bad. Uh, but chickens themselves, they can't really do a whole lot to defend themselves. Now, when we had our chickens, we had a brooding hen, which is what you want if you want to raise chickens. And when the eggs are laid by the mama chickens, I hope I get this right for those of you in here who really know what you're doing, um, they don't always want to sit on the eggs. And if you don't take them, you know, for breakfast, um, you know, they abandon their nest. The eggs just stay there. You got to throw them away. But there'll be a brooding hen that will collect all the eggs, everyone else's eggs, and she'll sit on them until they hatch. Sometimes one chicken will be sitting on so many eggs that they kind of move out past the perimeter of the chicken, you know, and she kind of moves around and keeps them all warm and, and they hatch. And after the babies hatch, it's like one chicken, you know, raising a whole bunch of little chicks um, because it's her passion in life, I suppose. And the other chicks have, or chickens have something to do. And when a threat comes and threats come because chickens are like defenseless to just about everything raccoons, hawks, coyotes. I mean, anything will get a chicken and a chick, anything will eat a chick. When a threat comes, the mama chicken will grab up those baby chicks, scoop them up into a pile, 
and jump on them and just fluff out and put her wings out and just protects them. And she just looks at you with all the little baby chicks under her wings. Now, she can't really do anything. You probably could just bump her and she'd fall over because they're pretty defenseless. No teeth, you know, they're just chickens. But her point was, and my point to you is, that love always protects. That love puts itself in between the person loved and any threat that may come to try to harm them. You stand in the gap. If you, as a person who wants to be protecting in your love, is willing to shield the person you love from any kind of attack, and it's not just a physical attack, it could be a verbal attack, it could be a circumstantial attack, where if you are the person you love, one of you has to be in pain, one of you has to take the hit, one of you has to be inconvenienced, one of you has to lose, you are the one who's going to lose to be inconvenienced to take the pain, and they are not going to because you are going to shield them. Love protects. Now that's just the first one. And this love protects probably resonates with a lot of us. I mean, we're protectors, right? Especially us men, we protect. Uh, protect my family, absolutely. My boys, absolutely. My friends, sure. But Jesus loved the world. That means the people we like and the people we don't necessarily like. It means the people who are like us and not the people who are like us at all. And, and so the protective love that we have to show starts with those closest to us, works itself out through our family, to our friends, to our coworkers, to our church family especially, and then to the world around us. But most of us can get on board with that saying, yeah, I'm a protector, I'll protect. The next one is a little more difficult. Love doesn't just always protect, love always trusts. How do you feel about that? I feel gullible. When you tell me love always trusts, well, I say, well, I've been lied to before. Well, why would I trust again? because trust is easily broken and takes a long time to, to gain back, to earn back. Love always believes in or believes all things. But this doesn't mean that love is gullible. It doesn't mean that love is sort of simple. You can even be a little bit skeptical, perhaps even a little bit suspicious. But when you process this, and we're gonna spend a day on each of these, so I'm not spending a lot of time on them this morning. This will be Tuesday. I'm not asking you to believe something just because someone says it or to believe them because you've chosen you're just going to flatly believe. But what I'm asking you to do is what the Apostle Paul is asking you to do, and that is to believe in somebody, not just to believe them. Love always protects. Love always believes in somebody, giving the benefit of the doubt, looking at what we assume are going to be intentions, and that they're good. That when we view people, we view them with a positive and optimistic sort of a perspective. Even though we know that not all people are good, we view them in light of the fact that they probably are trying to do the right thing. We're not dumb, we're not irresponsible. We don't allow ourselves or our family to be injured or unduly taken advantage of. But the Apostle Paul said that in general, your disposition toward other people is, you should believe in them. Have you become so suspicious and cynical and jaded in this world that you no longer believe in people? If Jesus had been cynical, suspicious, and jaded, not believing the best about people, he would have said, you know what? Most of these people aren't gonna believe. They're gonna treat me badly. I'm gonna end up dying. I think I'm just gonna sit this one out. But he looked at us and he saw the potential in us, which leads us to our next, our third of five. Love always protects, love always trusts, and love always hopes. Now the word hope is not the word like we use for hope when we're like, well, I hope I win the lottery or I hope I get a promotion or I hope I don't have much traffic on the way home or I hope I get a good parking place when I go to the mall. This is not the kind of word we're talking about at all. The kind of hope that comes from scripture is a promise of a guaranteed event that is yet to come. For us, it's that hope that Jesus gives us and salvation that's guaranteed for us. But when it comes to other people, when the apostle Paul says, love always hopes, 
it builds on the idea of love always believes in. And when I say love always hopes, what that means is, is that I don't just believe in you, but I believe in the person you are becoming, which means that I let you move past your past. Does that resonate or connect with anybody? The people who are close to you are the ones we practice love on the most. And we have to let them move past their past. Because if you are hoping, if you are believing in who they're becoming, you have to let them move past who they used to be. And it doesn't just apply to other people, it also applies to yourself. If God looked at us and said, man, that Rick, look how he failed me last year, five years ago, yesterday. <sighs> that Rick's just a failure. How discouraging would that be? But yet sometimes we look at other people that way. Well, my kids, my wife, my husband, my coworkers, my employees, the world, my country. Can you believe in what someone is becoming? When Jesus saw the woman caught in adultery and the men who were there to accuse her and stone her, he looked at her and saw the person she was, the person that got her to that point and chose not to sentence her and define her by that, but saw in her what she could be and said, that's what I hope in. And he took her by the hand and he said, you can live a different way. Are you willing to do that for people who are in your life? Well, love protects, love trusts, love hopes. And here's a really hard one. If these haven't been difficult for you yet, these all could be a week that we could spend and we just are out of weeks. So we're just gonna do a day. This one's Thursday for you. Love always perseveres. The word persevere is hupamone. It's a military term. Love sticks around, but it is uh, bigger than that. Picture a war movie and a strategic piece of ground that if you lose that piece of ground, you've lost the war. So you rally your troops and you say, this is unlikely, we're outnumbered. But if we lose this piece of ground, we've lost it all. So we will stand on this hill and we will fight even if we die. There's nothing more important. Well, that's the power behind the word that the apostle Paul uses when he said love always perseveres. It's a person who refuses to stop. Mark Twain tells a story or has an anecdote that kind of speaks to me. Maybe it will to you. He said, if you find a dog on the side of the road and the dog's been hit by a car, the dog's skinny because it's not been fed, it's got fleas and matted hair, and you pick it up and you put it in your car and you take it home and you feed it, you clean it up, you nurse it back to health, that dog will never bite you. And he said, therein lies the difference between dogs and humans. And the wisdom there even though it didn't come from scripture, it's true. And we have to decide that even though we're gonna get bitten, are we gonna stick around? Sometimes we leave way too early with a spouse who we stand before a preacher and a group of people and we read vows. We make a promise. I'll honor you and cherish you. I'll love you in sickness and health for richer or poorer till death do us part. I got it backwards and I do it a whole bunch. I should remember. But yet sometimes we don't persevere. Now I know sometimes there's no way to save a marriage. I understand that. And sometimes there's nothing you can do. Sometimes it happens. And for some of you, maybe it's happened. 
And I'm not trying to criticize you or judge you. I didn't walk in your shoes. I don't know the circumstances. I don't know what you lived through. That's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm talking about is I'm not looking at what happened in your past. I believe in the person you're becoming. And so I'm willing with you to put a period at the end of that sentence and say, from this day on, what happens in and through us is we stick around, we persevere, unless it's unsafe, unless it's unwise, because that's what love does. Parenting, I can't tell you how much it grieves me to see Christian parents who, because their kids have made choices that they find objectionable, whether a lifestyle or belief system, perhaps they give them a period of time, a couple of chances, and then for the sake of God, they turn their back on them and say, you're dead to me. Until you repent from your sins, you don't have a relationship with me. And it grieves me, and most of the time it's because of what we're worried about with the so-called Christian community and their judgment and we respond in a way that's so unbiblical that, that I think it grieves the heart of the Lord. Now you have to set up boundaries and parameters and we have to protect and we're responsible. And in some cases, of course, maybe relationships aren't safe or wise. But would Jesus turn his back on us because we've wasted our chances or we're living in a way that displeases him or we're embarrassed or ashamed? No because he believes in the person we're becoming. And love is only demonstrated best up close. Love is not demonstrated with a turn back. And regardless of what they may be doing or celebrating or believing, you don't have to delight in evil to delight in people. And whatever they do during the day doesn't mean that they can't be at your house at night having dinner and you can celebrate the parts of their life and the things about them that are worth celebrating. They're still your kids. Whatever's happened in the past, we put a period at the end of that sentence and we begin again. Love sticks around. Love doesn't quit. Love chooses the most important hill to die on, sounds the rallying cry, and refuses to give up. How about that? I mean, are your toes stepped on? Mine are. I get to think about this stuff all week long and, and work on it. And by the time I'm ready to teach it to you, um, you know, it's pretty well beat me up. And I've told you before, I don't compare myself to you. If I'm like, oh, am I more loving than you? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. But when I tell you that this stuff is hard for me, it's because I'm comparing myself to Jesus. And when I compare myself to Jesus, I don't do very well. I wouldn't even give myself a B. Um, we're not in competition with each other. He's the standard. And the apostle Paul says, agape love, it perseveres, it sticks around. Now, we're done with these four. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you'll have a, a whole morning to think about and a whole day to think about these things. The fifth one is found in 1 Corinthians 13, 8a. And it's kind of a summary, but sort of not. Love never fails. And the Greek word or the word that's translated into the NIV literally means love never falls or falls apart. That love holds it all together. That all 15 of these characteristics that we have talked about uh, over the course of the last nine weeks, they work together. And like we discussed in January, the first Sunday that we met together, this is gonna be the year that we are changed, that we're transformed. That 2024 will be a year that's different than any year we've had. And I promised you, I said, if you just come, if you just stick around, if you just show up on Sunday and you lean into the opportunities that you have and you just make yourself available to the Lord, I mean, just do the minimum. If you download a devotional and focus your thoughts, that God's gonna change you. 
And we talked about Romans 12, 1 and 2. Don't be conformed to the image of the world because they have a plan for you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and then you'll understand what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will really is. And love never fails is the exclamation point at the end of this series. But I understand that it's hard. And we're going to pick up with that in just a few minutes. Does this make anybody feel defensive, this whole... uh, message today. Like, ah, you know, you get out of my business, Pastor Rick, you don't know what I've been through and I did the best I could. And those are the kind of thoughts that I have when I look at my past and the ways that I've messed up. And here's a revelation that I had. This may not sound profound to you, but it's profound to me. Just because you did the best you could doesn't mean that it was the best way you could have done it. And we have to be honest enough with ourselves to say, even though I did my best, it may not have been right and own it and be willing to live a different way. And it takes a certain amount of humility and and a certain teachability that's the mark of a true disciple. But this stuff's really hard. Um, I just made a commitment recently to do something that I'm not 100% sure I can do. Um, I made a commitment to, to run a certain distance with a certain group of people who are all in their early 20s and um, it's for a certain time. Uh, and, and for them, it's a test. For me, it's just pride. Uh, but uh, I made a decision to do it. And the problem is I don't run. Uh, I, I walk and, um, and I walk every day. I try to walk three miles a day. Uh, and my miles, not that you're counting or care, but somewhere between 14 minutes a mile and 14 and a half minutes a mile. I carry a weight vest sometimes. I have to cut that distance in half um, and be able to run. And um, for me, that's going to be very, very difficult. I, I don't like it. Um, you know, when I run, I look like I've been wounded, like I'm running from a wreck or like I've been beaten and I'm trying to, you know, escape a, a scene of a mugging. And, but I made the decision. One of the reasons is because it's hard for me and I like to do things every once in a while that are hard because doing hard things um, is good for our character. And this is exactly what happens and what is going to happen. Um, to start off running, knowing that I'm really bad at it and knowing that I've made a decision that I'm going to accomplish this goal. I live on a street with an alley and the alley has about seven houses between me and a stop sign. And it's uphill. Now it's prairie trail, so it's not up a mountain, but it's uphill, right? And so first goal, run to the stop sign, right? Now you're like, oh, that's crazy. That's only 300 yards. So off I go, run to the stop sign, right? At the end, when I get to the stop sign, what do I do? (laughs) <laughs> Huff and puff. Because even though I can walk to the stop sign carrying a heavy load, I can't run to the stop sign. And so my neighbors are like, do you need help? Should I call 911? No, please don't call anybody. I'm doing this on purpose. So the next day, what's the goal? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to stink, but I'm going to stink a little less. And so I'm going to run to the next stop sign. And so I take off running and I get to that first stop sign and I'm like, I really should stop and wheeze, but why not just go a few more houses? So you look at the next house and you pass it. Then the next then the next, then you hit the stop sign and you stop at that stop sign and you bend over and you, you know, you breathe. Don't call 911. Get up the next day, repeat the process a little further the next day. You've tracking with me. And then pretty soon you pass the first stop sign and you're like, hey, that wasn't so bad. I haven't gotten to that point yet. Then the, you pass the second stop sign. That wasn't so bad, right? I mean, you're running for time. You know, it's crazy. Pass the third stop sign. And then pretty soon it's like, I'm running, right? And I look forward to that time. I don't know. I'll report back at some point if it actually happens or not. Here's the point. The point is, is that I have to get up every day and I got to be willing to go out and run to the stop sign, even though it's hard for me. And even though I'm not very good at it. And even though I'm going to look a little dumb, And the exact same thing is true with this whole idea of transformation. But just like our bodies adapt and it grows within us, the ability to keep going and pass these stop signs, the Holy Spirit of God in your spirit allows you to adapt and to go a little further than you thought possible, to live a little different than maybe you have before. And as you apply yourself and you give 100% of yourself, even though it's not enough, God does within you all of the heavy lifting and he creates in you a spiritual runner who's going to run fast. So you give everything you have, even though it's not enough, and you let God do the rest. Joseph did that. Remember the story of Joseph? 
Joseph, back in the Old Testament, his story is found in Genesis, occupies quite a bit or a little bit of Genesis. You'll see a little bit of it today. Joseph was born into a house of privilege and he was kind of a brat. Um, he was the youngest and uh, at least for a while and, and he was entitled. He didn't want to mow the grass. He didn't want to wash the dishes. Um, you know, he was one of those kids that was like, I got big brothers, they're going to do it. I'm dad's favorite, so I'm not doing nothing. And not only did he not do nothing, but his dad dressed him in this special robe made of many colors that meant he didn't have to go outside and do anything, that he was above it. And he sort of, you know, drug his brothers through um, or, or to uh, his dad's favoritism and through their lack of favoritism. And they kind of had hard feelings about it. Joseph had a dream at one point and his dream was something he should have kept to himself, but he didn't. He said to his brothers, I dream one day you're going to work for me. I'm going to run the company and you're going to have to answer to me. And then he looked at his mom and dad and he's like, you guys are working for me too. And when you work for me, I'm going to like it. Ha ha. And they said, listen, Joseph, the mom and dad, you got to keep this on the down low, right? I mean, dreams are dreams, but you're a little out of control. His brothers, however, didn't quite see it that way. They looked at him and thought that, that bratty little punk, we got to put a stop to it. And off they went with their sheep. They were shepherds to a distant area to find grass. Now the dad was like, somebody's got to check on the brothers and take them some food. He looked around to find somebody that could do it. And the only person he could find was Joseph sitting in front of his Xbox, right? And he's like, hey, Joseph, would you please put down your controller long enough to get on your air conditioned camel and ride out and, and just check on your brothers to give them these sandwiches. And he's like, dad, you know, um, finally got him to go. So off Joseph goes, you know, on this mission to find his brothers. So he goes, he finds his brothers. And as he's riding up, his brothers are like, man, I hate that guy. Now, I hope you don't have kids like that. But I mean, this was a dysfunctional family and um, they had so much dysfunction. We worked through their story together as a church family not too long ago. And as Joseph got close, the brothers hatched a plot. They said, let's kill him. Let's murder him. And um, that way we don't have to put up with his uh, brattiness anymore. So for a while, they thought that plan was good. You can see somebody coming on an air conditioned camel from a long way off in the Middle East. And as he got closer, they thought, well, why would we you know, kill him? I don't know. Well, let's just throw him in a well and just let him die. So he got close, they beat him up, threw him in the well, took his coat. They were gonna leave him for dead. Reuben had a little to do with that, trying to maybe hatch a plot to come back and save him later, who knows? A band of slave traders was coming toward Egypt and the brothers saw them and they thought, well, why would we just let him die? We can get some change if we sell him to these guys for slavery, he can't work. I mean, he's not very useful, but maybe he can do something. So they sold him. And he was taken to Egypt and then he was sold again, bought by Potiphar, who eventually put him in charge of his household. Potiphar had a really good looking wife who was apparently a little bored in her marriage and took a liking to Joseph and said, hey, come to bed with me. And he's like, uh-uh, I love God. He was growing up. I'm faithful to my master. You're really good looking, not interested. She pursued him. And he said, listen, I can't do this. And so she said, well, I'm gonna tell everybody you raped me. He took off running. She grabbed his robe. She accused him of rape. He was thrown into prison. But the Bible says he still trusted God. He was growing up. Went in prison, a couple of the king's hired hands had a falling out with the king and the king threw them in jail. They didn't know what was gonna happen, but they had a dream and they're like, oh, who can interpret this dream? And Joseph's like, I think I can. You can follow along with me in Genesis and the scripture we're gonna talk about is on the screen today. I want you to know it's not just me making up a story. And he interpreted the dream and he said, one of you is gonna die and one of you is gonna be fine. That was a bad, you know, sort of a thing to have to tell people, but it came to pass. So the one that was gonna be fine had made a promise to Joseph that he was gonna to go to Pharaoh and say, this Jewish boy interpreted this dream. You need to let him out of prison. And he forgot, or he didn't care enough to tell Pharaoh. So time passed and Joseph trusted the Lord because he was growing up. 
And Pharaoh had a dream that nobody could interpret. His own magicians couldn't interpret it. It was troubling him. And then this guy who was in jail with Joseph said, I remember this little Hebrew boy who can interpret your dream. So Pharaoh said, Joseph, come interpret the dream. So Joseph came and he said, I can't interpret the dream, but God can. If he will allow me, I'll tell you what, what God means in this dream. And Pharaoh said, okay, deal. And Joseph interpreted the dream that had to do with a famine. It had to do with the future of, of Egypt. And, and Pharaoh was so impressed that he put Joseph in charge, second in command of the entire country. So over about a 25 year period, Joseph went from being betrayed by the people who should have taken care of him the most, falsely accused of a rape he didn't commit, forgotten and abandoned in prison, and finally in a spot where he was experiencing a position of responsibility and authority and God's blessing. Now here the plot thickens. A famine had come to the land and Joseph had prepared for it because God had told him and he held the keys to all of the corn and all of the country and nobody could eat unless he acknowledged or agreed that they should. And it was his job to take care of the people. So his brother's dad said, look, we're starving. The brothers had no idea Joseph was even alive. They thought maybe he had been killed or, you know, who knows, who cares? And the dad said, you got to go to Egypt because they have grain, they have corn, they have food. So they went to Egypt and when they got to Egypt, they're like, well, you got to go see this guy. He holds the keys to the bins of all the corn. So they go, and I'm skipping so much good detail. If you don't remember the story, you really should, you should read it. They go before Joseph and don't recognize him. And so Joseph plays some mind games with them. He has a little fun, but ultimately reveals himself to them. And they freaked out as they should. And they said, and you can read this in Genesis 42, they said, please don't kill us for all the wrong things that we've done to you. Joseph standing in a place of honor with all the power of Pharaoh, the second in command in the land, finally had his boot or his sandal on the neck of his brothers they had walked in front of his car in the Hy-Vee parking lot and he was fixing to hit the gas instead of the brake. What would you do? They said, please don't kill us. Have mercy on us. And Joseph, he said these words, and it's my paraphrase. He said, listen, you're not God and neither am I. And what you intended for evil in my life, God intended for good. And not only was it good for me, and that's not the most important part, it was intended to save all of these people. And so even though you meant to kill me, God had a master plan. He was bigger and he is bigger and he has a master plan in your life. What Joseph knew and what I want you to know is that sometimes the worst things that happen to you allow the best things to be brought out in you. Without those terrible things, the best things could never happen. And that's a hard statement, but it's so true. Sometimes the worst things done to you bring out the best things within you. But we have to be willing to allow God to develop in us the ability to run a spiritual race where love lives within us. Peter struggled with it. You know, Peter, one of Jesus' best friends. Peter was a little bit crazy and I really like him. 
You didn't know if he was gonna cuss you out, if he was gonna cut you up, if he was gonna pretend he didn't know you, or if he was gonna tell you about Jesus. He's the only disciple we know for sure was married. Other ones might have been, but Jesus healed his mother-in-law, so we know for sure he was married. And he comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus this question. Now, I think he asked because he was married and he had forgiven his wife a certain number of times and he was hoping Jesus would tell him he didn't have to forgive her anymore. That may not be in the Bible. I just think that's what's going on because of who Peter is. And Peter said to Jesus, listen, how many times do we forgive somebody? He said, the Pharisees say three times. He said, how about three times plus three times plus one? Aren't I spiritual? Jesus, pat me on the back. And, and Jesus, <sighs> love never fails. And he said, depending on your trans, uh, translation, no, you forgive 70 times seven. You forgive as many times as it takes. And he was talking about per day, by the way, for as long as it takes, no matter what it takes. You forgive anyone who's wronged you because Jesus has forgiven you, no matter what they've done, because sometimes the worst things that happen to you allow the best things to be brought out in you and God is bigger. Love never fails. But first you have to forgive. Of course, you have to forgive others. We've talked about that at length. Some of you hate it when I talk about that, which is one of the reasons why I keep talking because I know when it hits a nerve, we gotta keep working and it's so hard. We gotta forgive others. But here is where I want you to think creatively. Secondly, you need to forgive yourself. Move past the defensiveness, move past the I did the best I could, move past the, well, if you were me, you would have done the same thing. Move past the justification. Just because it was the best we could do doesn't mean we did the right thing. And we own it. And it's not that big of a deal. We're the ones that are proud. We're the ones that put the obstacles and barriers in our life. We humble ourselves and we say, I blew it. I wish I hadn't, but I blew it. And you know what? I have asked God for forgiveness. If you haven't, we need to. And I'm gonna forgive myself. And some of you, and I know this to be true because I love you and you're my friends and we talk about this kind of thing. And it's not funny, it's just the reality. You still hold a little bit of a grudge against God. And in a sense, you gotta forgive him too because he didn't act very godlike in the way you expected him to. And he let all this stuff happen. Joseph could have held a grudge against God like you wouldn't believe. And most of us, like Job's friends, would have been like, yeah, I get it, 100%. But God was bigger. And Joseph was patient. And he was willing to run from one stop sign to the next, even though he looked a little dumb. And even though it was really, really hard. Forgiveness does not keep score. Forgiveness loses count. I'm wondering as we finish this series together, if you're willing to love just like you've never been hurt before. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for my friends and I thank you for this series. And in spite of my limitations as a teacher and as a man, you have spoken to us through your word. And that's what we've asked for. That each week we come and allow you to challenge us to give more and more of ourselves to you and you grow us, you change us into different people. And our thoughts and our responses and our worldview, our hearts start to soften, our relationships get deeper Life takes on more meaning. Part of us has no idea how it's happening, Lord, because you're doing it, but we do know that we've committed to run. And we together, Father, are committed to run. Not one faster than the other, but all of us as a church family, hand in hand, running at the same pace toward the same goal for your glory and yours alone. And I ask for you to help us, to give us focus, to give us strength, transform us, not for our goods, but so that the world around us can see you and the power of your gospel in a weak life like mine, like ours. I pray these things because I'm confident in you. 
I'm grateful for Jesus and the work that he did on the cross to provide the way for us to have salvation, meaning in this life and the guarantee of heaven to come. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray these things. Amen.